Hello, my name is Richard DeCrane. I'm here again here doing a Facebook Live. Um, some stuff is popping up on the computer. Okay, I got it. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, this is part four of our talk about powwow prevention and protocol. Um, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Karen Jerome DeCrane. I am Kiche Maya. And for those of you that have not turned in before, I am Richard's wife. Yay. And don't forget about Baby Yoda. This part now. Oh, just <laughs> But uh, yeah, so today, my special guest here, Karen, my wife, you know, my partner in crime. Um, thank you for the people that are tuning in. You know, um, if you like, you know, what I've been talking about or want to learn more, um, you can check out our, we have a YouTube channel now. Um, if there's other, you know, I'm a culture keeper here at the youth center and I do a lot of uh, working with the youth and working with the, the community here in San Diego. And, you know, and there's, but if you want more, you know, content, there's other, other culture keepers that we have on um, our, our YouTube channel. Uh, check them out. Also, you know, you just tuned in to Carolina. Um, she does the cooking show um, every week, every Tuesday, right before me at three o'clock. Uh, I do my talks on four o'clock. Um, yeah, so culture is prevention, you know, teaching culture, you know, um, recently we had really had to go during this pandemic, you know, change our way of thinking. Usually, you know, I'm in the community working with the, with the people one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, talking about, you know, culture is healing through a holistic approach. Uh, and today we're going to continue our talk. You know, last week I was uh, going to do a little recap last week, uh, last couple of weeks, uh, I've been talking about powwow and kind of protocol and, you know, how it all came together, you know, talking about the the origin stories of where it comes from. And, and my point of view, you know, a little disclaimer is, is my point of view, it comes from the Crow side of my, my where I'm from. I'm also... Dene or Navajo um, uh, from my mom's side, so I usually introduce myself as as being uh, Dene, a Dene man. I also introduce myself as being a crow crow man, you know, on my dad's side, and you know that's really important to validate those. And so the <clears throat> my talk, you know, that comes from um, my crow side, where the you know power traditions come from. You know, um, I try to do what I can. You know, this is more of a discussion, and I like everybody to to. To, to put in the comments, maybe you can even put pictures of old powwows or old photographs of old, you know, pictures of old powwows that you may have gone to, you know, um, and I'd like to hear, I've heard a lot of uh, different input from different people on, you know, how um, the powwows came to California. Um, that was, a, those were in my last talk and I got a lot of people, you know, interacted and shared some names, uh, some people that have come and gone <clears throat> And are, are no longer in this community, but at the same time, oh, I just uh, somehow just our table kick is, the table. Yeah, our table's rocking. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so we're not the first uh, powwow people, and uh, and we know we won't be the last. You know, we're just sharing our points of view to kind of do uh, of where we came from, how you know powwow came into our lives, and how you know it's been significant. How it, you know it kept, like I said, culture is prevention. You know, it kept us. On a good road, the red road, as some would say, um, and it, it, you know, it's you know kept my family apart. It, it, it's you know for me, it's near, near and dear to my heart. You know, for me, the the cult, the Powell culture, you know, comes from you know my people, and we have a past, we have an origin story um, that's been shared with us. And you know, I just wanted to share my point of view. I know each of us have our own stories how you know powwow came into our life and for us you know we want to kind of share our point of view and i think today our discussion is going to be um about you know kind of getting more in depth about with powwow protocol you know the positions and you know what it takes to to plan a powwow and uh so i got my you know my my wife here to help me out with that and she's got lots of experience with that um also you know myself i got a lot of experience with that you know um, held a lot of these positions that we're going to talk about and i know a lot of the origin stories but at the same time you know i know there's other culture keepers that are out there people with uh um 
rights and responsibilities, you know, that are, you know, that are willing to share, you know, I really appreciate the people that put there because all of us, you know, have a story of our own, all of us have a, a, a point, a, a position, uh, a viewpoint. And today, you know, I just want to share our viewpoint and how, how, it, how it comes together. And I think in past conversations, um, for those of you who are not local, we're filming here in San Diego, California, on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. Mm -hmm. And so the Kumeyaay um, powwow is not their way. Um, they have their bird gatherings. We are not experts in that. So we're just going to mention it, um, how they participate in the powwows. Um, there's a lot of cultural keepers from the local community that if you're interested, you know, and they're willing to share their knowledge with you, um, you can reach out to them. But there's Kumeyaay Community College, which is a great resource if you want to learn more about the Kumeyaay people. But again, this is just our interaction and how the bird singers have been involved in the powwow. So I just wanted to also make that disclaimer. Um, when I was um, about 18 years old, I uh, graduated high school, and I went to Palomar Community College, which is here in North County, San Diego, and um, my my family and I, my sister and I, we grew up like in the hood, and um, not, like none of our family had gone to college, you know, none of our friends were going to college at that time, and so my sister luckily had already gone to Palomar before I did. So when I got there, she told me you know, to go hang out um, at the American Indian Studies Department. And like I mentioned before, I'm Quiche Maya, my people come from Guatemala, but there was a lot of people at the AAS department that were really just welcoming, you know, and my sister and I have always been very proud of our heritage and where we come from, especially given the struggle, you know, that my mother had, you know, coming to this country, fleeing um, persecution, you know, our, our people were being killed in our country. So we've always been very proud, you know, made it very aware that we were Kichemaya, that, you know, we were indigenous, not Native American, but everybody was so welcoming. And um, during that time, there was a group of students there and uh, Michael Peralta was our chair of our Native American Student Alliance. And I remember um, he planned a lot of events for us. We went to conferences. You know, and it was it was really good for me because I had never, um, other than coming from Guatemala to San Diego, I had never gone anywhere other than here in San Diego. And you know, um, I got to travel with the club. But I remember one of the events that the club did is we would plan an annual powwow. And like I said, I was you know brand new to college, brand new to powwow life, and I didn't know anything about powwow. You know, but still, you know, the committee would invite me to the meetings, you know, so that I could learn, you know, and I remember like the first powwow um, I attended with Nisa was our Palomar College powwow. And I remember them telling me, you have to be here really early so that we can set up and I didn't have a car. And so I remember taking the bus from Escondido where we live all the way to San Marcos, which is like probably an hour to get on the bus there. But I remember taking the first bus that I could take so I could get there as early as possible. And I remember um, I got there and I was like, you know what, what can I do to help? And we had ordered chairs because at that time the powwow was inside the dome. And it's like an auditorium, they call it the dome. And so we had ordered some chairs and I guess they had gotten wet. So I remember Michael being like, get a rag and start drying those chairs. And I was like, okay, you know, that's what I got to do, then that's what I got to do. And then I remember, you know, when I was done with that, I was like, what should I do now? What do you need my help in? And he was like, make sure all the powwow drums, you know, and all the head staff always have water. That's your job for the rest of the day. Just run water to people and make sure that they they eat, you know, make sure they get their meal tickets. And I was like, okay, okay. You know, so that was like my first experience. And, you know, I was at Palomar for like probably three years. I got pregnant in between that time that guy's to blame for that. And so I spent a little bit longer at Palomar than I had planned to. And then, you know, during that time, I, I learned a lot from Michael and the other club members on how to plan a powwow, you know, and everything that went into it. And what I really liked about that experience is what I learned from them was reaching out to people in the community, you know, reaching out, you know, to people that knew about powwow so we could learn more about the proper protocols and so then, you know, I transferred to Cal State San Marcos, you know, and um, a little bit of history about Cal State San Marcos. Um, they had been doing a powwow for probably, I think it was nine years before I got there, but the powwow was run by Bonnie Bade, 
who I think worked at the library at that time. And so she, you know, had the powwow going. She was a staff on campus. And I guess a year before I got there, the students, you know, really, you know, talked to the university, to Bonnie, that they wanted to take over the powwow. They wanted to be in charge of coordinating the powwow. And so, you know, Bonnie handed over a binder. It was a really thick, like three, four inch binder to the students and was like, you know, here you go. It's a lot of work. It's really different to plan a powwow on a university campus because there's so much red tape. And so then, you know, fast forward a year later, I show up, you know, and there was only at that time, you know, Cal State San Marcos now has the Sovereignty Center. They have um, a really good recruitment program where they recruit a lot of natives, especially from the local tribes. You know, they, they have a lot of native students, but when I was there in the early 2000s, there was like less than five of us. I remember showing up to the club meeting and there was probably, um, I think at that time there was five of us. And I remember our, our advisor, Ronnie Whitehorse, telling us, you know, well, you need to start planning the powwow. And we we're like, that's not till October. Like, what do we need to start planning now? And then she was like, it's a lot of work. Like, here's your binders. Start looking at what you need to do. And it was really kind of upsetting because the students that fought for the powwow were no longer involved in the club. There was only one student out of the students that fought for the powwow that was still there when I got there. And like, none of us really knew how to plan a powwow. And so it's kind of like, you guys said you wanted it, but we're like, it wasn't us, we weren't here. But, you know, we didn't want the powwow to die, so, you know, we took on the challenge. And I remember um, our advisor telling us, you need to reach out to people, you know, and in the binder that Bonnie gave us, there was like a lot of contacts for past head staff. And so that's what we did, you know, we reached out to like Chet Hunt, he had been the gore dancer, head gore dancer, so we reached out to him, and Chet Hunt, he's Kiowa, and so he was really good at teaching us, you know, about, you know, the origins of the powwow, where the powwow came from, you know, from his perspective, from a Kiowa perspective. You know, we met with Roy Cook, who's no longer with us also, and, you know, he shared a lot of knowledge at that time. Roy Cook was um, a cultural keeper, I think, um, for, I can't remember that, that program Randy had. But anyway, so he, he would write up articles, he kept the culture, you know, for the urban natives, and then um, he was also a singer. Um, and so he knew a lot about powwow protocols, you know. And so I remember, it wasn't just like one quick meeting, I remember going out to Roy's, um, or Chet's facility in San Diego, it's in, um, what is that, North Park, that's where it used to be. and meeting with them several times so us students would carpool all the way down there and you know meet with them for hours at a time and they would explain everything about the powwow you know where it came from the protocols you know everything that goes into planning a powwow you know and then um at that time uncle henry rodriguez was still with us and so he would share with us you know how you know the local people were involved in the powwow and i remember driving up to his house up on the res you know, a lot of times and, you know, just spending, you know, time with him up there at his house and, you know, learning from him. And he would come to campus a lot, you know, they would always have him come do blessings. So whenever he was on campus, he would always, you know, tell our advisor that he was coming and, you know, we would always have lunch with him, you know, and he would share his knowledge with us. So, you know, I, I look back at the time in planning the powwow and it was, it's really stressful planning a powwow. There's so much that goes into it especially on a university campus but I think about the lasting relationships that I was able to develop with these people and you know one of the things that they always shared with me is that the knowledge that we learn isn't for us to keep we're supposed to share it you know with our youth with each other you know to make sure it, it keeps going and that's what they did you know they, they were true to the words that that they taught us you know they shared everything that they knew and so that's how I learned how to plan a powwow, you know, me and the other students, you know, all learning together, you know, and it, it was a lot of work, but I remember going through this binder and I'm a highly organized person. So there was all these tabs of the different things we had to do. And the first thing that we did is we had to pick a date for our powwow. And I remember um, our advisor telling us like, you have to figure out when everybody else's powwow is, because you don't want to overlap with anybody, you know, you're new to the game, you don't want to ruffle feathers, like make sure you don't step on people's toes, like figure out when all the powwows are so that we can pick a perfect date where we're not conflicting with anybody else. 
And so, you know, that back then, this was like early 2000s, there was no Facebook, or maybe there was, I don't know. But I wasn't on Facebook back then. So it was kind of like word of mouth. Uh, we had to go MySpace. to MySpace, huh? We had to go to different powwows here in the area and, you know, call other colleges, because other local colleges, you know, up all the way up to LA um, were hosting powwows. So, you know, reach out to different club members or different clubs at different universities and colleges. and. Kind of find out when their powwows were so that we didn't conflict with theirs so that was like the first step and then once we picked a date we had to make sure there was like a venue on campus available for that date you know and that's the other hard part because you know universities usually host multiple events on weekends and everybody always wants certain areas and we used to host the powwow on the soccer field and i guess they would do other other than play soccer they did other stuff there on that field and so we always had to make sure that our date, that the soccer field was available for whatever date we picked. But it was always in the fall. We always, you know, our goal was always to have it in, in the fall, you know, when powwow season is, is here in San Diego. Yeah. And do you have anything about that you want to add? Because you did the powwow at SDSU. And I remember, like, when, mm -hmm. when I was at Palomar, the powwow at SDSU was still held in Montezuma Hall which now is no longer there. I mean, there's a new Montezuma Hall, but it's not the original one. Yeah. So is there anything? I know there was a lot of stories that, you know, a lot the people, the community here shared. Uh, they came with Gambala, talked about um, how they were able to um, cook fry bread inside the university. A lot of times we're, we're stuck outside cooking fry bread out in the, in the, in the hot heat. Uh, the cold weather, you know, that, that there, they could cook it inside and they would smell the whole university all up. Um, but anyway, but yeah, just, um, Thinking about what you were saying, you know, um, I don't know if you saw from the thumbnail. There was a picture of uh, myself, um, Karen, and, and my, our daughter, our youngest daughter, our oldest, oldest daughter, daughter. <laughs> Violet. You know, um, and so I would bring back a lot of memories. You know, me in my uniform. I was in my Navy uniform. You know, they. I remember that was the time when Chet, Chet Hutt, um, had asked me to to you know help carry the flags, and I got to meet some of the original American Indian warrior. Society, Associ 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 American Indian Warrior. American Indian, <laughs> Ninja Warrior. Warrior. No, American no. Indian Warrior Association. Yeah, the American Indian Warrior Association. We're a veterans group, veterans group uh, here in San Diego. Um, we've been uh, been going with him, and you know, he was one of the first people that welcomed me to that veterans group. And you know, I got a lot of the same information that Karen got. You know, as far as Powell Protocol, just learning it about Powell. You know, I got a lot of information. I got to you know some of the rights to dance in what's called gore dance. You know, from Chet Hut. You know. And Roy Cook. And, and, and Roy Cook, and of course Randy Edmonds, and also, you know, um, a few other, you know, Kiowa people from back home. Um, uh, and so anyway, uh, just, I was just thinking about that, so kind of reminiscent and kind of went off topic. But anyway, that's, uh, that, 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 that uh, thumbnail was us back in the day, you know. Um, and so, you know, it's important to um, think about um, how, you know, we got our start, you know, for us. As students, I know we work, or you know, we work with a lot of students here that are just now learning how to plan, learning how to plan powwows. I know it's a really it can become a real hardship. You know, your grades can go down. I know when I was at Palomar, I went to Palomar College too. You know, at the time, you know, um, our advisor was um, Linda Locklear, and you know, she didn't want us to run the powwow because you know the kids, the students, you know, um, actually, you know, took on the powwow. But at the same time, you know, they were focused so much on the powwow that the grades went down. And so she, you know, that's what she told me that she didn't want me to do the powwow because uh, by, by that time, I've been to that powwow quite a few times, but I wanted to, you know, I was one of the um, students there and she wanted me to do other things. And I did, you know, little events, you know, little um, shows. Um, I had, you know, when Chuck Dot back in the day, if you don't know who Chuck Dot, he was a young grass I dancer <laughs> young grass dancer and back then you know now he does traditional dancing and so i got to meet chuck and and, and his young you know his his nephew or his son um uh the other kadatni um and i asked him to come out and do a performance for me it was a power house down you know we had them all set up and and we did like a performance at the you know promoting indian uh, our native um culture as far as dancing and singing and so you know I remember doing that over at Palomar College so that was my first you know real step into planning um, something big you know a community gathering a native gathering um, a gathering of Native Americans you know that's what it was 
And since then, you know, both of us have grown. You know, we uh, I think um, I think listening to Karen, I remember what's important. You know, important is um, having good allies. You know, you build you it, good when you plan an, a big event. You know, That's allies. Like the end of I know, but uh, you know, I just wanted to also talk about you know. Karen, you know, she's, uh, like I said, you know, like, you get a lot of talk, a lot of people say uh, indigenous or in native or, you know, and and last time I checked, you know, we live in America and America, you know, extends from the middle of you, the middle of Guatemala and up all the way into Canada. And so that's America. And then down too. And down, <laughs> down, that's South America. So, you know, we're all Native Americans and, you know, um, I always talk about, you know, some of the trauma that all of us Native people have gone through, you know, there's, you know, we've lost a lot of culture all of us and sometimes you know and there's spaces that are available for us you know i think that's really important that our native people you know come together you know stop being against one another work together you know even though you know maybe you're you know south of the border you know down past mexico you know we, we still can come together and work together and we become you know we're very you know we're very thinking about traditional stories you know um, I know some stories about, you know, my grandfather used to tell me that, you know, the, the Navajo people used to go travel down out there, and there, there's stories down in Guatemala of, of the Navajo people coming to them and, you know, trading and exchanging, and so, you know, so it's this is nothing new for us as Native people, you know, it's just been recently that some, that us, you know, we've been kind of uh, been against each other, but at the same time, you know, we're always been been together, you know, it's important to, to mention that also you know, in allyship and... I think one oh. of the things, like I said before, that my sister and I have always been proud to be Kiche Maya. Like, if you understand the history of our people, you know, um, just like what happened to Native Americans here in North America that was happening to our people. But more recently, um, like in the 80s, they were still literally murdering our people. And that's why we came here to America. But I remember, you know, I always felt like I, I didn't belong. When I remember Linda Locklear, you know, because we were going to go to a conference and I was like, well, I don't know if I should go because I'm not Native American. And she's like, but you're indigenous, you know, and I was like, you know, again, I grew up in the hood. I didn't know anything. And I was like, well, OK. And then she was telling me about Turtle Island. And if you look like Google Turtle Island, but if you look at Turtle Island, you know, you will see that America, you know, were North America and South America, the way that they're connected, you know, part of Turtle Island goes down south. And so she was telling me, you know, you're a part of us, you're our cousins, cousin tribes, you know, like kind of like welcome home, you know, come be with us, come hang out with us. And so I always felt like finally, like I could, we could just be ourselves and, and not be ashamed of being um, Kiche, you know, and um, it, it's, it's really hard. I think, um, and I, and I think about our urban native youth too, you know, how hard it is for them to leave, you know, especially if they come, you know, from where whatever state their people are from, they have to leave everything they know, you know, and come into an urban area, you know, and that, that's hard for us, you know, to have to, you know, leave everything we know, leave our people, leave our family, you know, and try to hold on to our culture as much as we can in this new setting that kind of tells you not to you know that forces you to assimilate you know and and so that's really hard but we've kind of gotten off topic but one thing i did want to mention about the venue is that you know at the university level you know once you get the venue it's not just like oh i requested this venue and that's it like we had to meet with like the safety I don't know what the actual department is, but like a safety officer that worked for the university and he had to walk the field, you know, and I remember, you know, we had to pass all these inspections, we had to get food handlers cards, you know, like all these things, you know, that the university required of us. And I remember one year and we had to get, we had to pay for security to secure the field, <laughs> you know, like they, and I was like, they're just pulling things out of thin air, you know, just to make it harder, but that's, actually you know what's required to plan an event on a university campus but I remember one year um, talking about allies you know I, I had worked really hard to develop a good relationship you know with the um, facilities at the university campus you know and one year I remember we showed up and it had rained and we had paid 
So we had to pay a company to come set up, you know, the whole field for us because they wouldn't allow us to do it. So set up like the canopies for the head staff, you know, and the drums and set up, you know, all the electricity. Like even though there was people in our group that knew how to do it, they wouldn't allow us to do it for safety issues. And so I remember we had paid a company to run electricity so all the vendors would have electricity for their booths. And I guess the night before the powwow, it rained. So the the boxes, the little electrical boxes that they had put down were not waterproof. So I remember the safety officer showing up and he was like, you can't run the powwow, you gotta shut it down. You know, these boxes, you know, are against the safety code. And I was like, what the heck? And I was like, there's people coming all the way from Arizona to sell their goods. Like we can't shut it down, it's too late. You know, I was like, what can we do? And I remember the facility person that I was working with was like, hey, we're doing construction on the other side of the university. Again, Cal State San Marcos was not as big as it is now, so they were still building at that time. But they're like, we're doing construction and we have those breaker boxes over there. He's like, I'm gonna take one of your golf carts because we also had to rent golf carts and the university didn't just let us use them. And so he's like, I'm gonna take one of your golf carts. I'll go pull them from that job site, bring them here, change them out. He goes, and at the end of the powwow, I'll come back and I'll pick them up and put them back. And no one will know because you know no one's here during the weekend to work. And so I thought that was really awesome, but that said a lot about the relationship building, you know, that we had done with the facilities people in the university, you know, and making them really feel like they were a part of our committee, you know, we would invite them to our committee meetings, you know, so that they could become allies, you know, and then <clears throat> once we had our day and our venue, you know, we would put out our save the date flyer, you know, and luckily there was always one person in the club that is really good with graphics, so they would create a flyer and you know we'd start going to powwows and handing it out and trying to figure out who our head staff was going to be you know and um what we learned you know especially from randy edmonds is that you know here in california they have a whole bunch of different head staff that most powwows don't have like richard had mentioned like the head man had woman and head young boy had young girl and even tiny tots but um so he was yeah and head veteran so he was telling us that the most important positions um, for the powwow are your MC and your arena director. And we've found that to be very true, not just as people that plan powwows, but people that go to powwows. You know, you your MC and your arena director really have to know, you know, about powwow protocol, the timelines for the powwow, you know, everything is in like a certain sequential order that happens. You know, and we've been to powwows where, you know, someone, you know, was nominated to be arena director and they didn't know what to do. So I remember, you know, and I was there as a spectator sitting there with my kids and there was just like dead air. And we're like, what's going on here? You know, and a really good MC and arena director, like if something happens or things don't go the way that they're supposed to, you know, and, and they're very experienced, they'll know how to kind of roll with the punches and just keep the powwow going because that's that's their job. You know, the committee, the day of, like we kind of take a step back, hand it over to the MC and the arena director. Like obviously we're still running around behind the scenes doing stuff, but the actual running of the powwow, you know, doing all the different things, the components of the powwow that then falls onto your MC or an arena director. So it's really important that those people really know what they're doing. And then one thing that was taught to both of us was that, you know, um, here, so like up north, they call it the head veteran, but here they call it like either the Eagle Staff Carrier or they'll invite a veterans group to to do the um, staff and to do the core dancing. But I was always taught that the Eagle Staff Carrier should be a veteran. Is more flashy or they dance really you know with a lot of veterans because you know this is a fact you can look it up on the um, Department of Defense uh, Native Americans warrior 
tradition. We can talk about that another day. But that's to our military, you know, even serving in the military before um, they were U.S. citizens, you know, like that's why we always have the head staff or the the Eagle Staff Carrier be a veteran. There's a comment. Uh, let's see, James Hermes says, I was AD at a powwow in 2015 and I ended up playing medic and treating the head boy dancer for heat ex exhaustion. It is a big job, but well worth it for the great spirit. Yeah, um, English is my third language, so I read kind of slow. But yeah, we also had to have, um, we had to pay to have an EMT on site the whole weekend and an ambulance just ready to go in case something happened so that we didn't have to do first aid. You know, but um, is there anything you wanted to add about that, babe? About the AD or the MC or the staff carrier? Mm, yeah, it's always, you know, like I said, when I when I run planners or when I pl plan powwows or, you know, organize powwows or, you know, I'm asked to be head staff, you know, as a head man or, you know, arena director or the different roles that, you know, I've been asked to do, you know, I always try to push that you know that that teaching that was taught to me you know the veterans or or the story it was their time to tell their story they were um actually not the first one in but you know at the beginning we, we let the the spirits and you know have gone on before us and then afterwards we we have that song that we have and then we have what's called the grand entry you know um and, and usually you know up or when i do it you know it's a lot of times it's the veterans that will bring in the eagle staff or you know, I, would, I always try to promote you know the american indian warrior society or even ava another um Warrior Society here in, in North County, North County. Paula. Paula and Rincon and a lot of these communities put their together their own color guard and, and, and you know I always try to promote that and do, do my best to, to, to do what I was taught you know not really trying to change the protocol that was that was you know established here in, in California like I said I come from um, Navajo and Crow on the Crow, Crow side you know we have our own ways we don't have head dancers we do have head veterans that come in and carry that staff but <clears throat> because you know for us it's like almost second nature we are all, all of us know you know the protocols of what, what's going to happen and we kind of grew up it's a way of life for us but on my the Navajo side the Nay side um, we don't have power so we didn't that wasn't our tradition or our culture and yet you know now in contemporary times and days in these days you know we have a lot of Navajo people uh, my people um, have been you know have been taking almost taking over powwows at times you know as a dancer you know the contest dancer sometimes they're like, oh man that, he just voted because he was for, he was Navajo and you know <laughs> just kidding but uh um but they make the best fry bread yeah they make they make the best fry bread if you have a Navajo fry bread you know, getting off topic. Fight. but uh yeah so <laughs> you know being the reading director you know is is a very important per part you know I you know I really take that um to, to the next level because a lot of things are left out you know ceremonial part of you know arena director you know um, that I was taught you know to go check the grounds you know like the some of the ceremonies that we do you know we as native people we always go and prepare you know we pre prepare before you know months ahead um, we check out wherever we're going to have our, our venue our, our, our setup we go you know go to that area and actually you know petition creator you know with tobacco and do offerings and start it in a good way you know that's how I'll, i've always been taught and so i always i'll be there you know months and weeks ahead um when i when we first start talking about you know planning the powwow you know planning the powwow is not just you know something you just do you know like i said for me as, as a traditional teacher or culture you know i, I petition as the creator um, to guide us and to help us, you know, with to offering tobacco, you know, prayer and at the beginning before, you know, because I, I know that's really important. I know a lot of communities just forget that or don't even do it. <clears throat> and, and, and it's something that, you know, I, I want to bring back and I've been bringing it back every time I, I help to plan a power or help to do a gathering, you know, I always try to try to teach that way. And so, you know, as, as a young student in my younger days, you know, I didn't know that and how important it was um, a lot of my teachings come from my my traditional people and my elders and where I come from and you know they've always taught me that way even when we have meetings like the NASA meetings or ASA meetings we, we did it that way our veteran groups we did it that way where we start with prayer and you know and Thanksgiving for stuff and so you know finding your venue you know starts with just that you know praying for about the things because I know um, things happen when you're planning a powwow or putting a 
putting together an, uh, an organized event, you know, and power and you know the power of prayer really helps. And at, at the same time, you know, it's a way of life for us, us as Native people. You know, getting back to that. <clears throat> Sometimes we forget because you know we live in the urban areas, we live in the communities. I know a lot of people um, that have taken you know, on you know powwows themselves, even like the Germans across you know overseas. <laughs> Uh, just thinking about them and they you know really inspire inspired by us as native people and they have their own powwows you know I've seen a video of them having their own powwows and even here in the United States you know uh, I have some good friends uh, that are part of the the Boy Scout community and they you know have been putting powwows and they have a lot of protocol that they took from us and used because you know they want to give honor and mention and you know, I have some really good friends you know I have my good friend Ryan you know I you know if you don't know this I'm, I'm honorary Boy or Eagle Scout <laughs> um, uh, I'll probably show my picture one day, you know, in my little uh, little shorts and little Eagle Scout outfit one day, maybe. Uh, but yeah, so you know, I've worked with communities like that, with people like that, and, and organizations like that, and you know, they have respect for us, and and and, and just getting um, kind of got off the topic there. Talking but I about think venue. for those those <laughs> groups that decide to do that, yeah, it's it's not okay to appropriate native culture. It's yeah. not okay for you. To throw a power like the people in Germany that are doing that like yeah. that that is not okay you know it's one thing to have native people come in and host a powwow in your committee or in your area you know be a part of that celebration it's a whole other thing for you to be like this looks cool let me do it that is yeah. not okay so I just wanted to make that disclaimer oh yeah you yeah know, we're and, not here to teach you how to do throw power we're just yeah. you know sharing no, I'm just saying like with yeah, the Germans just, or the Boy Scouts that you can't yeah. appropriate culture like you have to do it within the right parameters if you're oh, going exactly. to do something but going back to the venue I remember one year uh, we had hired security, you know, because um, we let the vendors come the day before so they can set up. And that's another really important thing. Like I said, it's really important to have like an MC and an arena director that know what they're doing, you know, and our arena director would show up like the day before when we were setting up, you know, the field to make sure everything was where we were going to put it. You know, they would walk with the safety officer and make sure everything was like where it should be. You know, and the arena director would be there to make sure, you know, because sometimes the vendors, you know, they fight about where their spot's going to be or if someone's selling the same thing as them, they don't want to be next to them, you know. And so, you know, the arena director, you know, would help us sometimes like when, you know, people were getting a little crazy about that. So it's really good, like when you have a really good arena director, they'll be there like when you start setting up the actual venue, you know, to kind of help you. And I remember Richard was arena director at UCSD and SDSU. And he'd be there like Thursday, Friday, power don't even start till Saturday. And I'm like, where are you going? He's like, we got to go set up this field, you know, and that's really helpful. But getting back to my story, I remember one year kind of to take it light, but, you know, take it to a light spot. We had hired uh, a security um, to come and stay and watch everybody stuff. And for some reason, I don't know what happened, that security guard didn't show up. And I remember, again, the safety officer from the university was like, somebody has to stay here. Somebody has to watch this stuff. And so I remember, um, if you don't know me personally, I'm like, I always lie and say I'm 5'4", but I'm like 5'3 and some change, you know. And back then I was tiny, you know, and I wasn't as thick as I am now. But I remember I slept in my little car. It was like a four-door sedan. Mm -hmm. I was sleeping in the parking lot you know, acting security, doing my rounds every couple hours, you know, with a flashlight. And I had like my, my stepdad had one of those giant, you know, police um, flashlights that they call them, you Mag know, lights. Uh, what is it, a cop, Mag a, lights. Oh, a yeah. cop beater. Cop and so I was walking around with it, ready to fight somebody if they were going to steal something. And so it's like, you know, sometimes when you're planning the powwow, you know, if things fall through, it kind of lands on you to kind of be in charge. And I remember when I told our advisor, when she showed up the next day, what had happened, she's like, honey, don't ever put yourself in that position again. That's so dangerous. And I remember being, you know, cause I'm straight hood. I was like, I was all right, you know, try me, you know, whatever. Yeah. But um, so going back to the head staff, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, the importance of our MC, you know, they have to know, you know, um, everything about the power, not just where the power came from, but like mm -hmm. the origin stories of the, the different dances because sometimes you know they'll tell that before people exhibition mm -hmm. you know they have to know you know where songs come from you know 
different singers might compose a song. So, you know, an MC that's really good would know who the composer is of a specific song, you know, know a lot about the drums that are, you know, they're singing, you know, they just have a lot of knowledge. And it's really nice because they kind of fill when there's like a slow, you know, when, when the power is getting a little slow, you know, and, you know, they have they always have tricks in their hat, you know, know how to get people moving, get people going. And I remember when when you know, we were doing a powwow um, at UCSD and um, Randy Edmonds was the MC and he was like, people are getting bored. We've already done all the exhibitions. What can we do? He's like, let's do a potato dance. And I was like, we don't have potatoes, but we have a bag of oranges because someone had donated like this huge like 10 pound bag of oranges. And so we did an orange dance. Oh, that they, was oranges were from Paula. Yeah, yeah, from Paula. They used no, no, to, not Paula. No, Rincon. No, Rincon. In between that. What's in between that? Palma? And Lena's, yeah, from Palma. The oranges from Palma. You don't know about oranges from Palma? Mm. <laughs> but anyways, so I remember Randy's like, we got to do something to get people up, get people dancing, get people moving. <clears throat> so we did, instead of the potato dance, we did the orange dance. But that, that says a lot about, you know, your MC and your AD keeping things going at mm -hmm. the powwow. You know, and I think Richard mentioned this, so we won't talk too much about it. But, you know, the gore dance is its own separate ceremony, you know, but here in California, they do the gore dance, you know, before the powwow, you know, so all the gore dancers will do, you know, their four sets right before the powwow. And usually, you know, we invite, you know, either have a head gore dancer or we'll just have a veteran society. And here in San Diego, there's the American Indian Warrior Society or AVA, the American, what does AVA stand? Association. Veteran Association. Mm -hmm. Um, up here in North County for the local tribes, you know, so one of them will either come out and run the gore dance or um, they'll be a head gore dancer. And then um, we always have the bird singers um, do the powwow or do do their singing before even the gore dancers. And so <clears throat> really briefly um, in Traditionally, the birds or the grass dancers would come out and prepare the field, you know, and with their dance, they would stomp down the grass, you know, of, you know, where we were going to be dancing and stuff. But here in California, especially at Cal State San Marcos on the soccer field, it's a really nice and ready to go for you. You know, they mow it a couple of days before and water and everything's nice. And so there, there really is, you know, no need for that right. opening. And so after we would have, you know, someone from the local community, and when I was there, it was Uncle Henry Rodriguez would do the blessing, you know, to bless the field and bless the powwow. And then we would always have the bird singers, you know, come out and do, you know, their portion, you know, of, of the um, powwow, which was just, you know, the bird singing. And I remember uh, my really good friend, Benet, one time when I worked with her, um, at Native Threads, and then she was, um, and what I love about Benet, she's really honest. She's like, I don't know what that crap's about. Why do the bird singers always have to go early in the morning when no one's there? Like, you guys always put the bird singers early 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, no one's at the powwow, they're just singing to themselves, like, what's that about? And I remember telling her that the way that we were taught, you know, that the students were taught is that, you know, obviously powwow is not traditional here to Southern California, you know, the bird singers are. And so to honor the bird singers and to kind of pay respect for them allowing us to do the ceremony on their ancestral um, lands, we should have someone from the local tribe do the blessing. Mm -hmm. And then we should allow the bird singers, you know, to do their ceremony before we even start, because that's like the proper protocol. And that's what, you know, we were taught from Uncle Henry. And so I explained that to Benet. It's not that, you know, we're trying to do it when no one's there. It's, you know, before the grass dancers would open, you know, and prepare the field. But the way Uncle Henry told me is that since you're here, you know, in the Kumeyaay Nation, you know, in the Senyo area, you should have bird singers from the local tribes come and open, you know, the powwow and, you know, to respect them, you know, and to, you know, kind of thank them for giving you permission, you know, to do your ceremony that comes from somewhere else here. And so that's why we you always see bird singers at the very beginning of the powwow. And then, you know, a lot of the times, you know, they'll come back during dinner break, you know, especially if there's like bird contest or they'll go on later on in the night again, you know, and so that's why it's done that way. And I, I just, once I explained it to Benet, then she was like, oh, she's like, I wish somebody would have told us that. She's like, because I thought all this time you were just throwing shade. And I was like, no, like it's to respect you. Yeah. So I think you should, you know, if you're planning a power or doing something, you know, 
you know, not only put them in, in the morning, but put them in, you know, after lunch or something like that, you know, put them somewhere else, like towards, towards the evening, you know, dinner, it's important. Break. dinner break. So, so they can, so we can see that music. Cause you know, since I really enjoy, you know, hearing the birds singing, I usually come early and I get to hear it every time, you know, I go early to powwows just to hear the birds singing. I go and I'll stay during lunch break cause they'll usually have the bird gathering, the bird um, contest during the lunch break. And, you know, I get to go see and listen to that song. Their, their songs and their dances, and it's really powerful. If you haven't ever heard, heard them, you know, it's really unique to California. If you go out across the country, you'll see other cultures share, other cultures sharing, but you know, this is unique to California and it's really powerful. And so something that I really enjoy and get to hear. And, you know, I, you know, if you're, so if you're planning a power and learning how to plan, put them in, make sure you, you know, look you to your, them. yeah, include them. So they're always really important to, um, include the local people you know the most important thing that you can do um, when planning any native gathering is to you know give homage to the to the to the, to the people that are local um, anyway I think the next thing I was going to talk about is doing the feed and so again I was telling you we had this giant binder with all these little tabs and it said the feed and so we would do a lot of fundraising um, we would get funds, you know, from the university. We would write grants to put on the powwow. We would solicit donations from people, you know, because the university wouldn't give us money to buy food for the powwow. And so that's why we had to solicit donations. And I remember Albertsons for a long time really worked with us um, to give us, you know, a really good price because we would always get um, the fried chicken meal. So it was fried chicken with potato salad, macaroni salad, and then some type of bread, and we'd always do a green salad. And I know, like, traditionally, we should have been cooking and providing that food, but if you've ever run a powwow, that's a lot of work when you're running around the day of. And so we would always do that. And then I remember um, one time I went, we, we were at a powwow as spectators, and it was time for the feed. And so, you know, we're all excited because we love to eat, go line up. And they gave Richard food and um, our daughter food. And I was like standing there and they're like, yeah, the food's just for the dancers. And I was like thinking, I was like, who do you think got them ready? Like, who do you think did their hair and got them dressed? You know, like, who do you think, you know, is running everything in the canopy? You know, and so obviously I didn't say that to the person handing out the food. You know, Richard just shared his meal with me. But that always stuck with me. And, you know, um, I've always been taught that to do things in a good way, you feed everybody that you can, you know. So when I um, was running the powwow at Cal State San Marcos, we would, you know, buy enough food to feed the dancers, feed their families, you know, and a lot of the times there'd be food left over. So we'd, you know, call the vendors up and make sure they ate. And then after the vendors ate, we'd be like, OK, anybody that's hungry, there's still food left over, come get some food, you know, and so to me, you know, like now, you know, that I'm not planning powwows, I am a powwow mom. And for all you other powwow moms or powwow dads, you know, people that don't dance but are at the powwow all weekend long, it's a lot of work, you know, like I have to get three people dressed, you know, I have to pack everything the night before, make sure everybody didn't for he does not pack. All he does is put it in the car. But he does I get myself dressed. He does Tetris. You always have me do your hair and tie things for you. And then I have to like literally you'll see me brushing what are those things? Your sheepskin? Because he never cleans them. So there's I'm always Laura. there's always these little those little spiky things stuck in there or grass stuck in there. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I do get them dressed, but and he, and he can't, he wears stretchy pants and stretchy shirts. So he says he gets himself dressed, but they're the kids and I, like Mr. Incredible, trying to pull down his stretchy shirt. So he does not get himself My dressed. But anyways, it's, it's a lot of work. And like the only time that I'm able to go get food is during grand entry because all the other spectators, you know, are watching grand entry. So there's no lines at the food vendors. And so I thought that was really rude when they told me that I didn't get food. And so I've always made it a point, like when when we help with powwows, you know, people bring us in as advisors. I always tell them, you got to feed everybody. That's rude. My grandma said, it doesn't matter how much food it is. If we have to split this um, potato in four ways so all of us eat, then that's what's going to happen. We're going to feed everybody. I know so. my favorite powwow feed it used to be, you know, at Pechanga. Oh, uh, they, yes. they used to have the best feed. They used to feed in this big old... Right next to the casino, they had this big old um, ballroom, and they would feed. They had like four 
um, little buffet mm -hmm. set up with all the gourmet food that they get from their, you know, their buffet. And we, as Indian people, got to go there and really just pig out. <laughs> I remember um, bringing like plates and plates back to the people, my, my auntie, my vendor auntie, or my grandma too. Yeah, and our grandpa. And I remember <clears throat> um, when the pandemic happened and all the powwows were being canceled, I remember our daughter was so sad because her favorite feed is the India powwow. Because they always do like a Thanksgiving mm. feed for their 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 powwow. Yeah. But she's vegetarian, so they always give her like extra vegetables and extra potatoes. Or <laughs> yeah, so she was really sad. She was like, "Do you think they'll still have the feed even though they don't do the powwow?" And I was like, "What? No, <laughs> they're not going to do a feed." But anyway, so going back to the feed, it's really yeah. important that you get enough food for everybody. That's all I want to say about that. And yeah. on. On a campus, because of the way that funds are are you utilized, again, we weren't allowed to use our, our university funds to pay for the feed. We had to do fundraising for that. Mm -hmm. So always keep that in mind. Like if there's some, you know, college kids planning a powwow and they give you fried chicken, you know, be humble and appreciate what you get, you know, because, yeah. you know, that's that. Could but, be just beans and rice. Yeah. And then um, Fundraising, like I said, you know, the university would give us some money, you know, just because we oh, were a club. I think we forgot the head man and head woman dance. Oh, yeah, we did. Uh, we'll just kind of mention it because we're starting to run out of time. But head man and head women, you know, was kind of a, a thing that was established here in California, uh, which are very important, you know, also to have their roles because they're, you know, they bring out the other dancers. Um, even, you know, in veterans time, you know, the, the veterans used to bring out the dancers. They would say, they would say go out there and dance. They would be the first ones to dance and they would wave everybody in and so you know that kind of role that they, they they play nowadays is the same thing the head woman and head man dancer you know usually traditional you look to them first to enter that arena to dance um and and follow what they do and they're a very important role role model that was in place here in california that you look to them you know and i always try to kind of stress that to to also you know pick a good man dancer that knows how to dance knows his protocols where he comes from you know because, you know, a lot of times I'll ask them to get up in front of the mic and share some of their little knowledge. And that's the way I kind of do powwows. But picking a head, good head woman and head men that's knowledgeable and, you know. And I think also um, picking people, like for, so for our powwows that we do at the universities, they're usually non-contest powwow, more traditional powwows. So we always try to pick people that, you know, are willing to host a special, you know, to kind of draw people in. You know, and that's why we pay them a little bit more, so they'll have money to pay out people and host a, a contest special in addition mm -hmm. to their giveaway or, you know, one or the other, whichever, whichever way they want to do it. You know, and also, like, one thing I want to stress that I was taught is that when you're, you're hosting a powwow, that you shouldn't ask your family to be head staff, you shouldn't recommend your family to be head staff, you know. Um, you should ask people in the community you know, because that's kind of, I guess the American word for it is nepotism, is if you're running, if you're a committee member and you're asking, you know, your family to be head staff, you know, and then everybody talks about it too, like, oh, they're head staff because, you know, you know, his, her sister's running the powwow, you know, yeah, so we yeah. don't, we want to get away from that too, but, you know, don't, don't be, rec if you're an advisor on a committee or you're on a powwow committee, don't be recommending your own family, like, we need to give other people a chance and, yeah, even in contests, I know, like for me, if I'm the arena director, you know, I don't traditionally, you know, I was taught that our family's not so supposed to enter in contests. So if I have family or relatives that are the head staff, you know, I don't do compete in the contest because it's unfair. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just respect for the people that your community, like for the Crow Fair, you know, we, we try to stay out of the, because we have our own contests, separate contests, but at the same time, we invite all these other powwow people that come and travel from far, far off lands and come to our area to celebrate with us. And we give respect by not entering their, their contests. You know? So there's the crow style contest yeah. for all the crow people. And then there's like the powwow contest for all the dancers that come throughout North yeah. America and Canada too. And so, you know, that was always taught to me just to yeah. respect yourself. It gives respect to your family and yourself, you know, mm -hmm. and if you're, you know, your person, you just, show, just shows respect yeah. for yourself and the family in traditional ways of teaching. And then also try to spread the love. Like if you know people that are really good, you know, dancers, they're good people and you're like, why haven't they ever been asked? I remember we have some really good mm -hmm. friends, mm -hmm. you know, that um, our son had been asked to be head boy at a local powwow. 
And, you know, I was telling, I was like, and I, whenever someone asks, you know, for one of our kids to be head staff or Richard to be like head man, I always want to know who the counterpart is, you know, um, to make sure that it would be a good match. And so I remember asking like, who's the head girl? And they didn't have a head girl yet. So I, I recommended, you know, um, one of the little girls that was in our um, singing or Soaring Eagles group you know, because she had really, you know, her mom had made her regalia and her beadwork and was she was always, age. yeah, she was always out there dancing. She's the same height as Tomas, yeah. you know, and I remember her mom came up to me like after the powwow, you know, that day and thanked me and said that no one had ever even considered them to be head staff, that their daughter was the first one that had ever been asked to be head staff. And I look at this family, you know, and, and they carry themselves in a really good way. They're, you know, traditionalists, you know, they go to powwows, you know, they got full regalia, beaded regalia. And I was like, why haven't they ever been asked? But it's because the same people always get asked a lot of the times. So, you know, we need to spread the love and make sure that, you know, um, other people, especially the children, you know, have a chance to be head staff, you know? And I remember um, when our daughter was younger, like a lot of the times you, you learn a lot from your children, but um, mm -hmm. when our daughter was younger, she was always being asked to be head staff. And I remember, um, she had been head staff like at two powwows earlier in the season and someone asked her to be head staff again and I remember her saying you know well I've already been head girl like when they came and asked her in a good way and gave her tobacco she was like I've already been head girl twice this year you know my friend Raina you know she she got her dress done she got her leggings done you know I think you should ask her because she's never had a chance to do it you know, and that to me, like as a mother was like a, a very proud moment of the things, you know, that we try to teach our kids, you know, these traditional teachings that have been passed down to us, you know, and um, that really like, I was like, wow, you know, like, you know, and she gets paid to be head staff, you know, and, you know, she was like, no, like I've done it enough, like another girl should have her turn. And so that's also important. And that's another reason why we don't nominate our own family to be head staff, because we want other people to have a chance to do that. We want other kids, especially to have the chance to, to serve as head staff. So, you know, make sure that when you're planning your head staff, you know, maybe look at, especially for the little kids, like for the head young boy and head young girl, look at up and coming dancers that maybe haven't had a chance, you know, so whenever people ask us for recommendations, I, I never, you know, recommend our son, you know, I always try to look at other boys, you know, other girls, you know, but that are either in our dance group or maybe part of our drum group, our drum family, or even, you know, just in the community, you know, especially local youth. There's a lot of kids from the local tribes that are now powwow dancing, you know, and we always want to showcase them. And then um, the most important thing about your powwow is advertising. Like you don't want to do all of this work, putting a powwow together and no one show up like that. That's the worst thing. We've been to a powwow where it was just like the head staff and their families. You know, I think we've been to two now. We went out in Joshua Tree or, you know, but we still had a good time. I mean, we, we were still, I think, what were you there? I think you were Eagle Staff Carrier or something. Remember up at Joshua Tree when no. Saginaw invited you? I think I was head core dancer. Head core dancer. Yeah, you were head core dancer because Tomas, baby Tomas danced with him. But it was just us head staff. I guess nobody wanted to drive out to Joshua Tree. But we had a great time. Like our friends, yeah. our powwow family was there. Grand entry was my kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, yeah. But I mean, we still had a good time. But again, from a, pow a committee standpoint, you don't want to do all this work and have nobody show up. So advertising is really good. And I think now, you know, I would have loved for Facebook to be around, you know, and Instagram to be around, you know, even TikTok to have been around when I was planning a powwow to get the word out there, you know, or powwows.com, you know, mm -hmm. to get the word out there about the powwow, because that's really important. And we would travel to powwows all throughout Southern California just to hand out flyers. I remember going into the um, student affairs department and I would print out like a thousand flyers at a time because they would let me print for free. You know, and then I go to powwows and just hand them out to everybody. You know, and sometimes people will be like, "I already got your flyer." I'm like, "Take another one, give it to a friend, invite somebody." You know, and so it's really important that you fundraise. And you know, back then that's how we did it. We had to go to powwows and hand out our flyers. Yeah. And then um, I think the non-native allies are really important, and that's something that I had to learn um, when I was a student at Cal State San Marcos. The dean of students at the time was Jonathan Pollard. And he's the one that told us, hey, 
you know, when you have your powwow planning meetings, you should invite, you know, the facilities people, invite the safety people, you know, invite, you know, the people that do the advertising is, I think it's the communications department, you know, invite them all, you know, so that they buy into the powwow. And, you know, that really did work. Like once they felt that they were a part of our committee, you know, and they obviously didn't make decisions on head staff. They, you know, mainly help make decisions, you know, on, you know, university level things like venues and facilities, things like that. And, um, paperwork. Advert- yeah, paperwork. But they really did, like I said, you know, when um, I had to replace those electrical boxes, you know, the facility guy is like, let me go, let me go borrow them, borrow them from this job site, you know. And so it's really important to make non-Native allies. And Richard had mentioned that when he was a student at Palomar, you know, Linda wanted him to focus on his studies so that, you know, he got good grades. She didn't want him to, like, be consumed with the powwow and, you know, forget about his enroll at the university was or at the college was to be a student. And so I remember when Richard went to San Diego State, his advisor um, was David Camper. And I remember um, Richard had started planning the powwow, but Richard um, went to the to university with his GI Bill. So he, he always had to be a full time student. You know, and so I remember um, Richard telling Camper, like, yeah, I don't have enough units to be full time. You know, I need to be full time in order to, um, you know, get my GI Bill for them to pay for my tuition. And he was off by one credit, one credit to be full time. And I remember David Camper was like, well, why don't I do a, what is it, special projects, independent studies? Independent studies. Independent study for you. And we'll give you credit for planning the powwow. You know, for this semester, next semester, we can do that, you know, and um, you just have to write up what you did or do a video, you know, for credit. And so that was really amazing, you know, that, you know, he was able to get college credits for planning a powwow for the university, you know, and then he met his full time requirement to get his GI Bill to pay for his tuition. You know, and I think about people like that, you know, I think about even Bonnie Bade that ran the powwow for so long at Cal State San Marco, she's non-native, you know, but she had a good relationship with Uncle Henry, you know, and um, other people in the local community, and that's why she did it. And it's really sad because, you know, I graduated in 2003, and they had the powwow one more time after I graduated, so it was October of 2003, Mm -hmm. and then there wasn't any students after that that wanted to do the powwow, so the powwow just kind of died out, and I remember going to powwows, you know, and like I said, like the most important thing to me out of that time in planning the powwow was the relationships that I developed, you know, especially with community members and singers and dancers. And I remember um, there's a drum group from LA called, um, what's Grandma? Whitebird? White Cloud? White Cloud. Um, the White Cloud singers. And I remember they would see me at powwows, you know, after that, and they'd be like, hey, when's your powwow going to happen again? And, and I'd be really sad and tell them there's no students to plan it, you know, and so I really think it's important that when a powwow is planned at a university level, that, you know, whoever's there, you know, at a faculty staff level to be there to help the students. So the students have input in it, but not are completely running it on their own because it is a lot of work mm-hmm. to do a powwow on your own at a university campus. And, you know, it's a lot of work any anywhere, but with the university, there's always a lot of red tape. And so, you know, I'm really sad that, you know, my powwow died out, you know, or the powwow at my college died out, you know, but, you know, things come and go, you know, there's, there's always, you know, waves, you know, and in that time since then, I've been able to, you know, be an advisor for other colleges and universities and help them with their powwows, you know, and um, just still continue to build the relationships that we built back then, you know, but, um, yeah, I think as, as a student, you know, it was really hard, you know, planning the Powell and putting it together. You know, I, I was put in that position quite a few times, and you know, I succeeded, but you know, um, I grew some white hair. Eh? Um, but at the same time, you know, jumping through red hoop, all oh, red hoops, <laughs> jumping through uh, the red, red tape. tape and working with the facility and the people and building those relationships is very important because you know, at times, you know, I, I found myself trying to, ed- you know, I was a student at the school, and I, was, I found myself educating, you know people about native, you know, our native uh, our culture, our, our, our beginnings, you know, why it was important that we do this, you know, this gathering or have this celebration or put together this powwow, you know, why why was it important for us as, as students, you know, as students, you know, we're, um, 
we're low in numbers. You know, we have there's a poverty line, just like the poverty line. We're below the poverty line. Even Federal the, poverty line. Yeah, even in in, in 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 colleges, you know, student the native student population is well below. You know, the the I guess. Well, they say native students are yeah. always one percent usually. At yeah, less or less less yeah. than that. You know, and, and I've seen that. And, and at the same time, you know, it's I I think. Um, yeah, so our, our, our point of view is from a student's point of view. And if you're a student, you know, hopefully there's a department. I know we've been working with some departments, you know, we work with UCSD, NSTC who have Native Queen American, Asia. yeah, Queen Mecca, Native American student departments and are they're really helpful in that, you know, they can take on the load or take on that, you know, that role where they do the paperwork as a student, you know, and it's really important. I know um, my friend Savia and her mom or uh, Savia at her school, she helps uh, plan the power for for dancing or dance bearing the trader at ASU and she's a, an alumni and She you know does so the alumni do the planning of the power, you know It's different than also, you know back home where, where, where I'm from pro country that we have different families that come in that have to um, basically uh, Petition and put in for it and, and, and they're voted to see if they get to run the power the next year and so there's different different ways to run a power put together in different um, aspects, and, but it, and in the end, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of fundraising. It's a lot of um, hard work, and you know, I want just to just to put it out there to you know give respect to those people that are planning powwows and putting it together because it's a lot of hard work. Especially and, if they're and, young kids, they yeah, especially learning. young kids, and you know, or college support students, them, support those young native students. You know, teach them what you can, and also you know, and if something goes wrong, like you don't get food. <laughs> And you know, it's not the students' fault. You know, it's just that they ran out of food. And allyship is very important. Like you know, because you can get free food. Like you know, I remember we went to, I went to Albertsons. Karen told me to go to Albertsons because they were giving us free chicken because or they wanted to donate the chicken to us because they you know didn't sell all of the chicken. So we took that. It was a chicken that they didn't sell. But they <laughs> donated because they knew we were students. Yeah. Don't be telling people you're giving them old chicken. Old chicken. No. No. Kidding. Albertsons has a program where they donate to yeah. like local organizations and universities and schools yeah. and so that's how they would donate and it would be fresh chicken they had just cooked <laughs> it and um walmart does that costco does that like in running the powwow i found out all people that give away like costco would give us free water and then i remember someone's like go ask the casino for water and i remember um i had asked somebody for water and they're like yeah we'll deliver it so i thought it'd be like a couple of cases uh -huh. and i remember showing up on the powwow grounds and there was like literally a pallet of water and it had like a a casino name on it and i was like oh, okay like thanks for all the water <laughs> you know like you know that was amazing i'm giving water to everybody that time but oh yeah yeah there's a lot of people you know and there's people that can't give money but they can give you like i said water they can give you know food snacks you know whatever's within their funding um guidelines yeah you know and then again like richard said you know this is just our perspective i've planned powwows as a student um and i've helped other you know um colleges and college students plan a powwow um, i don't know anything about planning a powwow you know on the res you know and so that's that's my perspective that i wanted to share mm -hmm. but you know if there's anybody any students listening that are planning a powwow really take the time you know to get to know people and develop those relationships you know when i think back of my time there you know um that's where i first met randy edmonds you know and now my son calls randy edmonds grandpa you know and um, i think about like roy cook and what he did for our family like that's how I first met Roy Cook was planning the powwows, you know, and not only did he bring Richard, you know, into the powwow as a gore dancer, he also got him singing again, you know, welcomed him when Richard wanted to start singing to sing with his drum group at first, you know, so I, I think about the impact these people had in our lives and even Chet Hunt, you know, um, I met him through the um, powwow planning process you know and he when he found out richard was a veteran you know because richard i didn't drive at the time so richard had to drive me everywhere and so he found out richard was a veteran and he's like yeah join our group you know join iowa become a gore dancer and um we were you know i was a starving student richard was in you know military we didn't have a lot of money and i remember them giving us 
everything they gave me my shawl they gave richard what is it your bandolier and your sash i don't know what they're called yeah yeah you know and so it's like they really took us under their wing so i think about all the relationships that i developed planning the powwow and you know all the blessings that it brought into mm-hmm. our lives into our family's lives and I would say, like, I remember, like I said, at that time at Cal State San Marcos, there wasn't a lot of students, you know, and I remember, like, um, I think it was probably 2001 or no, 2000, she says, um, our advisor at the time, Ronnie Whitehorse, was like, hey, there's an Indian that just started working here. <laughs> Go over there and introduce <laughs> yourself and see if she wants to be involved in the powwow. Yeah. And so I was like, OK, what's her name? Where does she work? And I think she worked at EOP or something like that. I don't know where she, I don't know what her exact title was. And at that time, her office was like on the other side of campus across the street. So I had to walk all the way down there. And I remember, I love when she tells the story is Dr. Elena Hood. She loves to tell the story that I showed up at her office. I kicked the door open and I was like, are you Indian? And then she said, yes. And I was like, come with me. We're planning a powwow. But, you know, um, it kind of happened like that. I was like, hi, my name's Karen. You know, I heard that you're native and um, we're planning a powwow. If you want to come to our next club meeting. But I love the way she tells it. It's so dramatic. But that's how we met, you know, and now she's, you know, one of my best friends. She's my kids' aunt, you know, and um, now she's Dr. Elena Hood. She wasn't Dr. Hood back then when I first met her. And so I think about all the relationships we developed, you know, it wasn't just a learning opportunity, but it was a real blessing by all the people that we got to meet and everything that they've brought into our lives, you know, all the blessings that they've given us, Mm -hmm. even their knowledge or their friendship. So really take that time to, you know, develop your friendships, develop those relationships. You know, it's, it's a good opportunity to get involved. Yeah, and then like we've said, I've said before, you know, on the topic like culture is prevention. You know, for us, just look at us. You know, my family, my family, we, you know, we've grown with the power, we've become power. You know, my son, look at him, he's beating. He learned how to do a craft. He's and not so taking does, orders. Yeah, you know, no, he's not. He's, but my daughter also, you know, I got to mention her. She was a dancer. She still dances, and she knows how to bead. She knows how to craft, and you know, and like I said, she she's a good. If you, she's a good egg, you know, if you don't know who she is, you know, a lot of people know her. Have a lot of respect for you know my son knows the stories the traditional stories and he can you know mc or tell the story of how he learned and you know like i said culture is prevention and family you know we, we stick together um and you know i think i just you know want to make that point um that it's good you know good to participate you know like i said everybody can dance and everybody can participate in some of the stuff that we do um and like I said, you not when you you know we, not only in my own small family we we build family outside, uh, our we build more native family. Like I said, like she was saying, you know, our power our, family, our, our power family has our grown. drum family. good way you know a good just give a stack to one vendor and like if um my the story that i work with um dancing bear new trader um and don't get started, don't get vendors that sell the same thing yeah especially if it's a small powwow to like our head staff or we were going to honor money we would go and buy the gifts from our vendors that day so that you know we can make sure that everybody made a sale you know and so you know if you're planning a power stuff yeah so you can put like i said add this is a discussion so you can add comments you know about Maybe you have a tip or something for students, if students watching this or someone that's wanting to plan a powwow, that if they're going to watch this, you know, they'll see that little tip that's in the comments or, you know, that share um, and and do that, you know. Um, so this is our point of view. Just wanted to share that with you guys and then give a, a perspective of, of planning a, a, 
uh, of a powwow, you know, this um, subject of powwow came came to me because, you know, about this time, you know, it started to be spring, you know, we're getting into that powwow mode. Usually, you know, I was said before that I would, I'd be going out every weekend to, to a different powwow all over this country and enjoying myself and, you know, that, that, that sense, you know, that, that pride and all that stuff that it makes me feel good inside. I'm not, not able to do it, you know, at this time, but at the same time, you know, I, I still do some of my craft work and still do, do, do a lot of my traditional, you know, healing stuff. And, and I think working with the clinic, you know, um, you know, culture is prevention. Um, it's a big thing to learn in, in, in self-care and taking care of yourself. And so if you're out there, you know, like I said, to kind of keep taking care of yourself, you know, keep, care, keep washing your hands, wearing your mask. Um, we're almost out of COVID. We're gonna be able to gather and come together real soon. You know, at the same time, you Dr. know. Dr. Fauci said not till the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of sad. Some of those powwows that I saw um, we were promoting, but at the same time, you know, there's some virtual powwows. You know, yeah. uh, I don't want to. Don't say get it. anybody excited, I, but <laughs> don't mention it yet. I would say yeah. one thing: we're not medical experts. Yeah, obviously, we don't have degrees in medicine. But since Richard mentioned washing your hands, wearing your mask, social distancing, if you get the vaccine, you still have to follow those protocols. You know, until everybody, till we reach yeah. herd immunization. So um, the clinic, the clinic, and actually all three clinics here in San Diego are vaccinating. But the clinic that we work with in San Diego, they're vaccinating Native Americans. Don't tell them yet. I got to get mine first. I haven't anyone got my over? You already have your appointment. I'll be anyone, there at five o'clock in the morning. Anyone over fifty-five? <laughs> um, what is it? Essential workers. And I had one other category, I can't remember it. So the San Diego American Indian Health Center is vaccinating natives. Mm -hmm. um, I think last I heard, Rincon had run out of vaccine, so they weren't scheduling any more appointments, but they said they should get some this week. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anything about Southern Indian Health other than that they are vaccinating. So if you live in that area, you'll have to call them. But mm -hmm. you know, that, that says a lot about, you know, tribal sovereignty and, um, you know, the government adhering to, you know, trust um, or treaty requirements and providing those vaccines to you know native americans first you know in the treaties it says that they're supposed to provide um, education and health care so that's really great take advantage of your tribal trust responsibilities that they're using and giving you your vaccine if you're open to that if you're not that's your choice too we don't discriminate you know whatever you want to do but since richard mentioned after you get your vaccine you still have to wear your mask wash your hands and social distance yeah Anything else? Weren't you supposed to promote um, a YouTube channel? Yeah, so I guess um, something, some news that I didn't know, you know, I didn't know I was a YouTuber. <laughs> so <laughs> you can find us on YouTube now, you know, at the American Indian Health. Um, I think we're going to put the link in the description, as they say. And subscribe, like, you know, I'll give you a virtual fist bump. Hey, I'm going to start talking to YouTube. Um, okay, if I get 5,000 likes. Yeah, if I get 5,000 likes, I'll reveal something sacred a i'll shave my beard I'm trying to get those likes that's his covid beard he can't <laughs> you shave know it. all those uh youtubers start talking about that but anyway yeah so we have a youtube channel you know it's not only me talking you know there's other uh, people like randy edmonds there's a story that's on there it's his, his journey coming to you know the urban areas is on there um also um um, carolina doing the cooking matters yeah there's um um even um What's that guy's name? Paul? <laughs> the guy that there's a cultural class for the adults they do on Fridays. Mm -hmm. So he's done some classes. Um, there's art classes. Yeah. There's stretching, like fitness. Oh, yeah. Things like that. So and check Rob, it out. Yeah, Rob. Uh, yeah, Margie, Rob and Margie. Margie and Rob um, with uh, Well Brighty. Well Brighty. Well that's on there. Also, you know, we have other um, native um, elders that are on there. Um, 102. Uh, Joe Renteria. <laughs> Joe Renteria. I think he's and like then, 104 uh, now. Um, I can't, oh, for, I don't, yeah. He's still, you know, a good source, you know, look to him for some good stories and listening to his perspective and where it comes from. And also, you know, I think uh, a really important person uh, um, at SDSU that I remember she was a, a facilitator, not facilitator, she was a faculty member long, long ago. Um, and she has stories too of how you know the students used to put together um, the powwow there at San Diego State. 
She also knows how the American Indian Studies Department came about. Yeah. There's like so much history at these universities. It would be good if someone recorded them. Mm -hmm. um, that's Gwendolyn Cooper that he was mentioning. Like she was there when the American Indian Studies Department was created at SDSU. Mm -hmm. um, John Roulard um, started the powwow there too, in addition mm -hmm. to the American Indian Studies Department. And she was, she was a student there at that time. So she has all this great history. Yeah. You know, and so um, there's a lot of people in the urban native community that have a lot of information about, you know, how certain things came about. And then, you know, like there's Linda, you mm -hmm. know, that's been at Palomar, you know, for as long as we can remember. So she has a lot of that history, mm -hmm. you know, and then um, at Cal State San Marcos, you know, there's been a lot that's happened, you know, now with the culture, cultural and sovereignty center, mm -hmm. the sovereignty center. You know, they do a lot of programming there, but even before the Sovereignty Center was there, you know, there was faculty and students doing amazing things there, like planning a powwow, mm -hmm. you know, um, other things too. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of good history at the local universities, you know, so check that out. Yeah, so yeah, it's good. So you want more content, you know, check us out there. And you want more of me, hey, um, you can tune in uh, via, via commercial free. Hey, I know Facebook's doing a lot of commercials, but, uh, yeah, so YouTube, um, check that out. Um, I think that's it. Um, other than that, you know, you guys have a good day. You know, thank you, thank you to Karen for coming to share this uh, little story time, a uh, little experience. You know, our discussion about powwows and and, and, and the topic itself. Um, we could talk a lot more. I think tune in. Actually, I'm going to be doing a live. Um, I'll do a little plug for Dancing Bear Indian Trader. They have a live show on Friday. It's called Late, late Night Craft Talk. Late Night Craft Talk. I'm going to be talking about the um, how um, how Palo you know got how Cal or how Palos came to California is our topic. And we have a lot of other things planned, a little skits, and it's a really fun late night native show because I'm going to be on there. It's native. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a fun show to get out and watch. Uh, I'm going to be going to have to stay up past my bedtime. You go to sleep by 8 30, so I'll be on live at 8 p.m. 10 p.m. He doesn't even know. 10 p.m. He'll be on at Friday. 10 p.m. on the Dancing Bear Indian Trader Facebook page. Yeah, so I'll be on YouTube. They have their YouTube page too. And then UCSD is hosting a youth conference this Saturday. It's um, Comienza con un Sueño. It begins with a dream. It's for Latinx, Indigenous, Native youth. Um, it's culturally appropriate or uh, culturally responsive um, programming, you know, to get the kids to college, to motivate them. Um, if you want to see more of us, we'll be there too. Um, so um, I think I've shared it on the Soaring Eagles Facebook page and on my Facebook page. So if you have any youth in junior high to high school that are interested in attending, it's also open to parents and educators, pretty much open to anybody to go to that conference too. Yeah, and we'll put that in the comments so you guys can uh, link to that. Uh, actually, my son, my son. Our moderator is doing his <laughs> homework, so he's not posting yeah. anything. Our son, Thomas, usually does that for us, I but I'll, I'll do YouTube. it. He did the oh, YouTube. Oh, he posted so, the YouTube, sorry. Uh, high tech guy, you know, I got a kid, you know, put him to use. Just kidding. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. We'll, we'll, we'll see you guys next week, next Tuesday. You know, I have a, a fresh topic, maybe a new topic. Maybe we'll talk about something new. Then we'll talk about something old. If you have any ideas. Maybe we'll talk, talk about, about something that I'll just the same. I'm starting to get my YouTube out. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, virtual fist bump. A belly bump. Uh, virtual belly bump. We should, oh, actually, I, no. I was trying to make it more indigenous or virtual sage but I don't have my sage with me. I'll give you a virtual sage and you guys have a good day. Good evening, good night, whatever time of the day it is for you. Um, we'll catch you in the next one. Thank you, Karen, again, for being here, being co-host. And have a good day. Good night, good day. What is it, good like 10 hours? I don't know, we've been talking for 10 hours, I think. <laughs> I know, I saw it earlier.